Mountain Springs, so good to greet you this weekend. I'm off this weekend celebrating my son Isaac's graduation from Pine Creek High School. That's our third graduate. We have four more to go. But this weekend, I have the privilege of introducing the guest speaker, Ben Stewart. Ben and Kathy were former members of Mountain Springs prior to God calling Ben to lead the Uncharted International Ministry in Indiana. It's a ministry that is doing brave things for God around the world to advance God's kingdom. But without further ado, can we give a very warm Mountain Springs welcome to my friend and a guy that we love here at Mountain Springs, Ben Stewart. <laughs> hey, you guys. Hey, uh, it's great to be back with all of you guys. Like Daniel said, my name is Ben Stewart, and uh, we used to be not only living here in Colorado Springs, but we were, for a season of that time, part of this Mountain Springs family. And so it's always a pleasure when I get to be back here with all of you. I was here back in January, uh, helping wrap up the Go Boldly series, the series when you were walking through the book of Acts. And, uh, and now I get to be here this weekend as you're going through the Nicene Creed. Um, so it really is great to be back. Love, love this family, love Daniel and his family and what God is doing here at Mountain Springs. Before we dive into the content for this morning, though, I just I want to have, uh, if it's okay, just a, a little bit of a family moment. Um, I know that I am a stranger to a lot of you, uh, but I feel like in light of what has recently happened in our nation, um, but also just in general what, is com- what we're coming into today uh, out of our weeks, I want to read to you uh, a part of a psalm because I think it's important to understand what this moment is about as a family. Um, as I was worshiping over there and, and just really enjoying God's presence, this, this psalm came to mind. It's Psalm 73. And Psalm 73 begins, the first half of it is the writer of this psalm really just lamenting about the realities of life, really lamenting about how things seem unfair, the evil of the world, the brokenness of the world, uh, the pain and the suffering that he experiences in his own life. And the first half of this psalm is just a very raw expression of this writer lamenting about the realities of these things. And then it says in the middle of the psalm, until I came into the sanctuary of God. Until I came into the sanctuary of God. And then the whole rest of the psalm is sort of like this new perspective, this reorientation about his life and about life in general. And I think that's an important place to start this morning in light of yet another school shooting in our nation but also the things that are just happening in our life. That brokenness and pain and suffering is a very real thing. It's a very real thing. But I love how we can gather on a consistent basis like this, and we can acknowledge how glorious and how great God is. And I know that the heart of Daniel, I know that the heart of Bobby and the worship team, I know that the heart of the leadership of this church is more than anything else that when you come on a Sunday, when you come on a weekend and gather in this way, that it will be this sanctuary presence, this sanctuary experience where you come into the presence of God and there's just a new orientation. That you can leave, yes, with the realities of the brokenness of the world, the things that seem unfair in life, But because you have come into the presence of God, because you have experienced his goodness and his greatness, there's new perspective as you leave this place. And so this morning, we we want to acknowledge uh, the the school shooting. We want to acknowledge just the brokenness uh, and and the pain and the distraction and and everything in our life uh, that is very real. But at the same time, We desire that this place, and I know it has been already for me this morning in that time of worship, that this place would be a true sanctuary. It would be a place where we can encounter the presence of God and leave with a new orientation, a new outlook on the world, on life, and what is happening in our life. So that's, that's, uh, would you join me in praying for that this morning, that God, thank you for that uh, reality that already through just fantastic worship, music, this place is a sanctuary. We come acknowledging um, the, the different pain points or frustrations or, or things that seem unfair, or even just the distractions. 
Maybe you're just tired. Maybe we're just coming in tired. Would this be a sanctuary? Would your presence just be enjoyed in this place? So that when we leave here, there's a new perspective. There's a reorientation that takes place. That we see the world around us through the lens of who you are. And so we thank you for the privilege and the joy of what it is to gather in your name, to come into your sanctuary and to enjoy your presence in your name. Amen. Well, I do have the opportunity and the privilege to continue the series that you guys have been going through, the Nicene Creed, the Nicene Creed. And in case you haven't been here for a few weeks or in case you've forgotten what the Nicene Creed is, just some quick context is that the Nicene Creed is just merely some, some core statements, some core affirmations, some, some we believe statements that some ancient faith fathers came together during the reign of Constantine and uh, Constantine came together in the region of Nicaea. That's why it's called the Nicene Creed. And they were responding to some heresies of that day, some false teachings about Jesus primarily, about the way, about Christianity. And so these ancient, to us, these ancient fathers come together and they put down these core statements of we believe. And this, these statements, the Nicene Creed, has become sort of a core reflection of this is what it means to belong to. This is what we believe as a Christian faith. And so it's been really fun from a distance for me to be following uh, this series that you guys have been walking through. And I have to say, if Daniel were sitting here, I would say the same thing, but I'm actually kind of glad he's not because I'm going to completely throw him under the bus right now, all right? Um, I'm, I'm so thankful that Daniel gave me the most easy, non-controversial, uh, no landmine whatsoever topic of baptism, because I get to talk about the phrase, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. Now, I say that sort of tongue-in-cheek, but it's true. That especially if you've grown up around religion or faith of any sort, baptism, the topic of baptism, can, can become very emotionally charged. It can be very divisive. It's, it's pretty complex. It can be very complex and very uh, 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 conflict-ridden. And, and there's groups, there's, there's whole groups of churches, there's whole denominations that say, our, our stake, our flag is over here with baptism, and if your flag is over here, then we can't even relate to each other. And, and so I, I want to acknowledge the, the, the complexity of what this topic could be, but here's my hope. Because for me, personally, it's been a lot of fun preparing for today and doing my own personal study because, honestly, it's, it's been challenging to me. Um, it's, it's been ex exhortive to me, like it's, it's been moving me, but it's also been comforting to me uh, and really just encouraging. And so my hope is that you will not leave here from this time, you will not leave here more confused on the subject matter, that you will not leave here with the waters more muddied in terms of baptism, that you won't leave here angry like, I can't believe that guy would say it like that. We should never let that guy back into this church. But, but that through, through the exploration, through the exploration of baptism, as we talk about it here, that you'll actually leave with a little bit clearer sense for who Jesus is and what it means to belong to him. In other words, I, I hope that when you leave here from this time, you'll be able to say, yeah, he talked about baptism, but I feel like we actually really just saw Jesus through this time. And so to do that, I want to talk about baptism. I want to look at this statement. What does it mean that we agree, we affirm, we believe in one baptism for the forgiveness of sins? I want to do that by looking at baptism through three different lenses. Three different lenses. For those of us who wear glasses or contacts, we all know that the primary purpose of glasses is not to remind us of how old and decrepit our bodies are, um, but it's really to bring clarity, right? Right? It's to sharpen, it's to bring into focus, it's to help us discern what something is and what something is not. I am not going to answer every one of your questions about baptism. I'm not going to explore every little nuance of baptism. But I do hope that through these three different lenses, there's a little bit more clarity and definition. Um, 
when we, over the next 30 minutes or so, when I'm talking about baptism, what I believe, when I see uh, taught in the New Testament scriptures by the New Testament writers is that unless they delineate, unless they specify differently, when you see the word baptism, they are referring to that physical act of being baptized into water. And so when we read scriptures this morning and when I talk about baptism, that is what I'm referring to uh, just for the sake of clarity on that note. So when we talk about baptism, three different lenses that I want to look at uh, in terms of this topic, and we're going to have three different passages that relate to each one of them. The first lens is the lens of identity, the lens of identity, looking at baptism through the lens of identity. And what I mean by this is that baptism is a representation. Baptism is a representation It's an outward representation of an inward reality. It's an outward representation of an inward reality. There's a beautiful truth here that Scripture is teaching us that I hope we don't miss this morning. There's a beautiful truth, friends, that when we come to faith in Jesus, there is a change in identity. There is a complete change in identity. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 talks about this, how we are new creations in Christ Jesus. Colossians chapter 1 talks about this, where Paul says that we have been transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his son, Jesus Christ. That at the moment we come into relationship with the Father through Christ by grace, that at that moment there is a complete overhaul of our identity. That this isn't just a veneer change. This isn't just a surface change. This isn't just a change of activity or behaviors or language or what we do see or what we don't see, but this is a complete change from the inside out, the core of who we are. There's a change of identity at the moment we enter into relationship with Jesus, and baptism is an outward representation of that inward reality. Throughout the morning, I'm going to share with you a few different analogies Some of them are pretty straightforward and simple. Some of them are attempt to be a little bit humorous. But all of them, here's the deal. All of them break down, okay? Every analogy and metaphor is gonna break down because we're we're trying to use human language to talk about divine things, all right? So when I use analogies, if you're like, well, that doesn't make sense because if you go, I I know, I know it doesn't make sense, all right? But just stick with me. Baptism is an outward representation of the fact that in Christ you have a new identity. It's much like a wedding ring in that sense. It's much like a wedding ring in that sense. That almost 17 years ago when I stood before a pastor in front of witnesses and really before God across from my wife, Kathy, that what made us married in that moment, what joined us as husband and wife in that moment was not the wedding ring, but it was this vow that we made to each other. It was this covenant that we made to each other, this promise that said, I will be faithful to you. I will be your husband. And she said, I will be your wife. And we made this covenant before God that said, we are committed to each other. It was that covenant that we made to each other, that promise, that vow before God that that brought us into this new, the old single Ben Stewart no longer existed. Now it was married to Kathy Ben Stewart. My identity completely changed in that moment. And as a result, everything else did. My behavior changed. The way that I related to people changed. The way that I related to the world changed, right? The single Ben Stewart would go on dates with random people whenever he could get them. But the new Ben Stewart, the married Ben Stewart, only dates one person. Behavior changes. Behavior and activity does not change identity. Identity changes behavior and activity. Now, when we got married, it was that covenant to each other before God that made us married. And the wedding ring, although it's important and cost me a lot of money, it is merely an outward representation of this change of identity. It's something that not only speaks to me, this is who I am, but it speaks to the world, this is who I am. It's not like married, not married, 
married, not married. Married, no, I am married. I, this is who I am. And this is an outward representation of that reality. Friends, when we enter into relationship with Jesus through faith, baptism is an outward representation to say this is my new identity. Let me show this to you in Galatians chapter three. Galatians chapter three. Go ahead and turn there if you want to, or if you have a Bible app, go ahead and turn it on to there. Galatians chapter three. Paul is writing the book of Galatians to the church in Galatia. And actually, Paul is responding to heresy also at that time. And he's basically responding to the heresy that uh, people are saved by grace, but then have to continue through works in order to maintain their salvation. He's like, no, 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 no. You're saved by grace, and your salvation is maintained by grace. It's by grace alone, he says. And it's in that context that he writes Galatians chapter 3, where he's talking about the law. He's talking about the law and how every person was at one time is under the law. And the purpose of the law is to reveal our brokenness. The purpose of the law is to reveal our sin. It's to reveal our depravity. He says we wouldn't know <laughs> We wouldn't actually know how depraved we really are unless the law existed. But then he says, the law does something else too. He uses the word tutor or teacher or guide. The law is like a guide that not only reveals our brokenness and our depravity, but it also points us to our Savior. The law not only reveals to us how desperately we need to be saved, but the law also points us to our Savior. And so it's in this context that he's talking in, uh, in Galatians chapter 3, and I'm going to pick up in verse 23, because I want you to hear identity change language. Listen to this. But before faith came, verse 23, but before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law. We were in bondage. This is old identity. This is pre-relationship with Jesus through faith. You were bound, you were enslaved, you were guilty, you were condemned, you were full of shame and full of sin. That's who you were. That's old identity. But before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith, which was later to be revealed. Therefore, the law, here it is, has become our tutor to lead us to Christ, that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, here's new identity. We are no longer under a tutor. For you, here it is, you are all sons and daughters of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you, here's our word, for all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. I love this word picture that Paul is giving us. He's saying, this is who you were. You were under law. You stood condemned. You were guilty. You were full of shame. You were full of sin. This is who you are. But now through faith in Jesus Christ, you put on Jesus. It's a complete overhaul of identity so that when the father sees you, he doesn't see your guilt. He doesn't see your condemnation. He doesn't doesn't see your sin, but he sees his son, Jesus Christ. And so now you are no longer this, you are this. You are a son. You are a daughter of the king. And baptism is this outward representation that says, I am clothed with Christ. Let me briefly touch on two characteristics of this new identity. Two characteristics of this new identity. First, as a child, you are secure. You are secure. We don't have time to read the whole passage, but just a few verses earlier in Galatians chapter 3, 5 through 9, just in those few verses, several times Paul talks about how faith, it is by faith, it is through faith, it is in faith that we are secure. Our salvation is secured by faith. Our justification is secured by faith. Our blessing is secured by faith. Listen, friends, works 
are not the foundation of our security. Faith is. But now think about how beautiful this truth is. Because think about how insecure, how incredibly insecure of a world we live in. How riddled with fear. Overwhelmed by anxiety. Filled with doubts. Everything from, well, where's the next school shooting going to be? To, where's my next paycheck coming from? To, What's this doctor's visit going to be? And everything in between. We live in a very fear-ridden, insecure world. And isn't it a beautiful reality that as a child of God, you can leave here with head held high and chest out saying, I stand secure by faith in Jesus Christ. That I am his. That he loves me and that that is not changing that I am accepted by him and that that is not changing. I am secure in him. You are secure in your new identity and you, second characteristic, is you're living living in freedom, waiting for glory. I've got to read this passage. It's too good to pass up. Uh, Living in freedom, waiting for glory. Listen to this. Paul in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verses 14 through 17. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, here's some, all the same language, these are the sons and daughters of God. For you have not received a spirit of slavery. You have not received a spirit of slavery, leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons and daughters by which we cry out, Abba, Father, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Friends, in this new identity, in this new identity of which baptism is this beautiful outward representation of this change, this new identity, not only do you live secure, but you live free. You are someone who is living free, waiting for glory. You are free from sin. You are free from its power. You are free from its punishment. You are free from its hold. You live free as a child of God. And so we affirm, we acknowledge, we believe in one baptism for the forgiveness of sins because it is this beautiful outward representation of this complete identity change that has happened in our relationship with Jesus. So lens number one, baptism, the lens of identity. Lens number two, relationship. Relationship, And what I mean by relationship, as we're looking at baptism through the lens of relationship, uh, what I mean is that baptism displays intimacy. Baptism displays intimacy. I know that's, that, that, that might be a, a word that's a little unnerving to us, that, that word intimacy. But stick with me on this. Listen to this. Baptism is an expected It's an expected aspect of our relationship with Jesus that announces our intimacy with him. Okay, those words were chosen carefully, so listen to that. Baptism is an expected aspect of our relationship with Jesus that announces our intimacy with him. Another way of saying it is baptism identifies us. It sort of like connects us with Christ and all of the major parts of his redemptive work. It connects us. It identifies us with Christ in this very intimate way and all the major redemptive parts or, uh, parts of his redemptive work. Here's what I mean. In Romans chapter six, listen to this. Romans chapter six, Paul again. He's responding, Paul, Paul writes in such a way in the book of Romans where he's like, addressing or answering or responding to sort of imaginary uh, arguments. And that's how it picks up in chapter 6, verse 1 of Romans. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace might increase? No, never. May it never be. How shall we who have died to sin still live in it? Here we go. 
Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus, same language as Galatians chapter 3, we have been baptized into Christ Jesus, have been baptized into his death. Therefore, we have, buried, we have been buried with him through baptism into death in order that as Christ was raised from the dead through glory of the Father, so we too might walk in the newness of life. Here's, here's what's happening, friends, that baptism displays this intimacy with Jesus and all the major parts of his redemptive work. And we just read about those, that we are baptized into death with Jesus, that just as Jesus died, so we die that we are baptized into his burial, that just as Jesus was buried, so we are buried, and that just as Jesus was raised into new life, you are raised into new life. And baptism is this intimate connection, this identifying with Jesus that these things have happened to us. And look at the beauty of what Paul says as he continues to explain that. In verse five, for if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, your old self was crucified with Jesus, that your body of sin may be done away with. Here's the same language, that you should no longer be slaves to sin. Friends, baptism, it displays this intimate connection and identifying with Jesus that your the punishment for sin the power of sin has been put to death. It is buried. And just like Jesus was raised again into victory, so you have victory in this life now through Jesus, empowered by his spirit. This gets really practical and really awesome. Because that means when you leave these doors, whatever that sin is that feels like it's holding you down, whatever that sin is that keeps breaking that relationship, whatever that sin is that keeps fostering distrust, whatever that sin is that keeps building guilt and shame in your life, it has no power over you. You have been, it has been crucified. Your old self has been crucified with Jesus and you are raised into new life. And baptism is this beautiful identification with the realities of what Jesus has done in our life. And I think, friends, that there's two extreme unhealthy views of baptism that we have to acknowledge. One unhealthy extreme view of baptism is that baptism is necessary for salvation. There are, there are whole groups of churches that say a person is not saved unless they are baptism. I think that that is incongruent with what Scripture teaches. In fact, Paul and other New Testament writers will go out of their way to ensure us that we understand it is by faith alone, by grace alone, by Christ alone that we are saved. But I think in some ways out of fear of that extreme, we go to this other extreme where we significantly minimize and reduce the significance of baptism. This was my camp. This is how I grew up. I was baptized when I was eight. And we say things, we say little pretty things about baptism, like, yeah, you know, you should do it because it's an act of obedience. You should, you should do it. I think it's so much more than that. I think, yes, while it doesn't save us, it's, it's this expected part of the whole conversion experience here is the most mind-blowing analogy you are going to ever hear in your life. This is going to just change everything for you, okay? It's like Chick-fil-A, all right? Here's why. I'm going to come back. You hang on to that, okay? If Paul were standing right here, if Paul were standing right here and I said, hey, Paul, can there be a Christian who is totally saved but is not baptized? I think Paul would say, well, yeah, of course, but why? Why wouldn't they be baptized? It's like going to Chick-fil-A and getting the number two spicy, not the deluxe, the number two spicy, but not getting the Chick-fil-A sauce. It's like, well, yeah, you can, but why wouldn't you? That's where it breaks down, okay? displays this 
beautiful, intimate connection with the redemptive work of Christ that we have been put to death, buried, and raised into new life. So yes, we affirm one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. Finally, the lens of mission. Mission. Now this one was totally, this one caught me off guard. Uh, This is not just convenient one for me to say because I happen to be part of a mission agency, but this one was a lot of fun for me to discover. In preparation for this weekend, I was reading a book by a guy named L. Charles Jackson, and it's called The Faith of Our Fathers, A Study of the Nicene Creed. So I was reading this book, and when I got to the chapter about this statement, uh, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. He talked about how baptism is connected to mission. I've never seen this before. This is fun. He says, when the average Christian is asked to describe the great commission and the gospel, he seldom mentions the sign of baptism as central to the Lord's great mission on earth. Christ, however, did make baptism a fundamental element of the Great Commission. I love this. Baptism is a symbol of the ongoing movement of the Great Commission. Matthew chapter 28, unless you've never, uh, if you've never heard of the Great Commission or it's been a while since you've heard it, read Matthew chapter 28. We see Jesus saying this very thing. And Jesus came up and spoke to his 12 disciples saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. What? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Baptism is the marker. It's the banner. It's the marker that says the church is alive and well and we are actively engaged in the mission of God. It's the marker that unifies all believers. Here's your final analogy. I I think it's like the Braveheart moment. It's Braveheart on the Battle of Sterling. And you see all these different clans coming together. And they have all their own little tartans and all their own little banners. And they they come on and and there's like they're there and they're an army, but there's fracture, there's division. And, And then William Wallace comes riding in. And what does he say? Sons of Scotland. And he unifies, he unifies these divisions, he unifies these fractions under this unifying banner. This is what baptism is. Baptism calls us away from ourselves. Baptism calls us away from ourselves unto the mission we have as members of his church. Our natural tendency is to be selfish, but baptism calls us away. It calls us away from a selfish way of living. Baptism is a constant reminder that I am called to move beyond myself. Baptism is this unifying banner. It's this marker that says, regardless of your skin color, regardless of your ethnicity, regardless of your socioeconomic standing, regardless of your gender, we are sons of the King. We affirm, we acknowledge, we believe in one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, friends, because it's the banner under which the rallying cry says we are the church, we are alive and well, and we are engaged in the mission of God. We acknowledge and we affirm and we believe in the baptism of sin for the forgiveness of sins because it is baptism that identifies us in this very intimate way with the reality that your sin has been put to death in Jesus, that the power of sin no longer has hold of you, that you have been raised into victorious life. We acknowledge, we believe, and we affirm in one baptism for the forgiveness of sins because it's this beautiful display to me to you, to the world that says the old is no longer who I am. I am a new creation in Jesus. I have a new identity. I am secure and I am free because I am a child of the King.